We know that the Pasha of the week always speaks to current events. It's just amazing, incredible. If you look in last week's Pasha that we read yesterday, in yesterday, Bamidbor Lamid Gimel, Pasok Nun Aleph and Nun Bet. God says, when you cross the Jordan River, make sure you drive out the enemy from your land. So Rashi wonders why it's the connection when you cross the Jordan River, drive out Hamas from your land. Why does the Torah put the two psukim together? So Rashi says something amazing. Listen to this. Ripped from today's headlines, buddy. Rashi, a thousand years ago. What is the connection between crossing the Jordan and driving out the enemy from our land? Says Rashi, this is what Moshe was saying. Remember, 40 years after Moshe split the Red Sea, Yeshua Benun, in Joshua chapter 4, split the Jordan. Right? You can look it up. We have a big deal about the splitting of the yard, the splitting of the Kriyas Yamsu. There's a holiday called what? Seventh day of Pesach. Who knows about 40 years later, Yeshua Benun split the Jordan. How come there's no young tip to commemorate that? What am I chopped liver? So if you read Rashi, yesterday's parsha, you'll see something amazing. What does crossing the Jordan have to do with driving out the enemy? Says Rashi. What Moshe is warning them. Why is God going to split the Jordan for you? Why is God going to make that miracle? The only reason that you're crossing the Jordan and God is performing the miracle of splitting the Jordan in Joshua chapter 4 is that you should drive out the enemy from the land. Vimlav, if you do not drive out the enemy, mayim boyim v'shotrim etchem, a wave of terror, a wave of terror will sweep over you. Koinki dinky? No. Yesterday's Rashi. Now we know, Ruvain, why there's no Chag to commemorate what? Splitting of the Jordan, like the Kriya Sam, because we didn't drive out the enemy. We let them remain here. We brought them back. We brought them back. So therefore, we didn't expel the enemy. Therefore, there's no Chag to celebrate what? Kriyas Yardain, a great miracle, because we did not fulfill our part of the bargain, says Rashi. The bargain was, I'm performing the miracle, splitting the Jordan in Joshua 4, on the condition you drive out the enemy. Vimlav, if you don't, there'll come a wave of terror will sweep over you. Rashi, yesterday's Rashi. Isn't that incredible? Now, the Torah goes on to say, if you don't drive out the inhabitants from the land, by Midbar Lamed Gimel, Pasig Nun Hei, if you don't drive them out, those that remain here will be daggers in your eyes and knives in your back. And they will terrorize you on the land that you live in. You hear this? Yesterday's reading by Midbar Lamed Gimel Nun Hei. I'm translating. If you don't drive them out, those that remain will be daggers in your eyes, knives in your back, and they will terrorize you in the land. Says Rashi, Lesikim Be'enechem, look at this incredible Rashi. Rashi said, Yisedo Tamenakoit Enechem. They will terrorize you with nail bombs that pierce the eyes. Now you remember the Sparrow Pizza Shop bombing in August 01? You could go back to the Jerusalem Post archives. The, the bomb was packed of nails. And the victims, Nebuch, had the nails embedded in their eyes. You could look it up in the Jerusalem Post, August 01. Rabbi Yaakov Goldman, how did Rashi know in the year 1040 that they will terrorize you with nail bombs, nails that pierce the eyes? And Nebuch, the victims of the Sparrow pizza bombing, the bomb was packed with nails and screws, and the victims, you could look it up in the Jerusalem Post, Nebuch, they had nails embedded all over the bodies, including what? How did Rashi know that in the year 1040? It's just amazing how the Parsha of the week always speaks to what? Current events. The Torah warned us. They will terrorize us with nail bombs, etc. And we won't be able to live here if we do not, what? Expel them. Incredible. Okay, that's the current events. And this week, that's what the reading yesterday. That was the reading yesterday. 
You're reading this Shabbos, Shabbos Chazon, it's just amazing, it's just amazing. Shabbos Chazon, the Torah tells us, this week's parasha, is, is what, is Devorim, Nochon. The Torah says that the, the enemy will attack you, Kashetaseno HaDvorim, Yedis Sharona. The enemy will attack you, Deuteronomy 1, Pasuk 44, the Amorite. Hamas will attack you, Kashetasenu Hadvorim. As the biz 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 the mazet dvorim in Ivrit. Bees. Now, I would understand lions or bears. Why does the Torah say in this week's Pasha, Dvorim 1, 44, the enemy will attack you, Kashetasenu Hadvorim? Bees. Biz 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 biz. Why not a lion? A Russian bear. What's up special about bees? Bees, after they sting, they die. That's Hamas. They know they're going to get killed. But they can't help themselves. Just like bees sting, and the result is they, they die. So Hamas, that's our peace partners. Who are you trying to negotiate with? We have a hell of a ceasefire, buddy. I'm not joking. We cease, but they continue to fire. <laughs> cease fire straight from Chelem. The Torah says they're like bees. Bees can't help themselves. They sting and then they drop dead. That's, they can't help themselves. They have to terrorize us, even though they're going to get killed. The only way is to destroy them completely, not to play games or knock on the door and they call them up. Avakashah. Uh, we don't want to harm you. Please evacuate. Tell <laughs> them. Or they drop a dummy bomb on the building as a knock to make sure the terrorists can what? Leave. And therefore our boys have to be mauled over there. Nebuch. The pilots, you, Ron Benishai, he's not a right winger. You read on the internet, he says the pilots complain to him bitterly that they're not allowed to fire on terrorists, because there's uh, terrorist children around there. And meanwhile, I chayalim have to get blown up. The pilots of the IAF complain to run by Yishai and Ynet. Their hands are tied. They don't let them shoot the poor terrorists. So our boys have to go in there and get blown up. Get Isn't that incredible? Where is our leadership? But, but, right? That's what, that's what it is. But the Torah warns us. The Torah warns us. What do we do? Contact your congressman. I don't know. What can we do? You mind, mind yourself? What? Well, that's. I want to talk about that. That's a, a separate issue. Okay, we're going to talk about that. But anyway, but anyway, do our soldiers have to get killed because the pilots in the IAF, their hands are tied and a lot of fire on the building with, with terrorists? Send the boys in there, Ruvain. It's madness. It's madness. Right. Right. But anyway, let's get to the topic. The topic, and we'll tie it into current events. Could have Yochan ben Zakkai have prevented the Khurban? Living with decisions. Could have Yochan ben Zakkai have prevented the Khurban? Now, uh, please double up. You're looking with somebody. I don't have enough. Uh, if the second temple, if the second temple would not have been destroyed, buddy, that means no Shoah. Do you know that? Jewish history would have taken a completely different turn. The Talmud says that Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai could have prevented the Churban, thereby preventing what, Rabbi Yaakov? A Holocaust. But he made the wrong choice. Like we made the wrong choice nine years ago when we expelled 10,000 Jews from our homes, their homes, our homes. And now the chickens have come home to roost. Living with bad decisions. Well, what's going to talk about? Look at footnote number nine. The tragic dilemma of Yochem and Zakkai. Could he have saved the temple? Footnote number nine. From Tractate Gitten. Yochum and Zaki had his conversation with Aspasionus, and he predicted that he would be what? Kaiser? Right? And then a telegram came from Rome 
that the, the Senate has elected you, Aspasianus, what? Okay, sir. And uh, he said, Omele, footnote 9, on top. Mezlos, you have to go back to Rome. The Inishachrina Meshadrona. And I will appoint my son, Titus. He will take over. And who destroyed the temple? Titus, Titus his son. Now, Titus was the uncle of Targum Unculus. You look in the Gemara Gitten, Uncle Unculus, the Targum Unculus, the Gerd Sedek. His uncle was Titus. And when he converted to Judaism, Unculus, Titus disowned him and wanted to execute him. Eze Busha, a nephew of the Roman Emperor, should become a dirty Jew. He disowned him. Therefore, he was called Unculus, Uncle Less. <laughs> Titus was the uncle of Unculus. Looking at Mary Gittin, when he converted, it was Eze Bushevacherpa, Titus disowned his nephew. So he became Uncle Less. Chava. He became Uncle Less. Okay, Baruch Hashem, you got it, okay. After Geirut, he became Uncle Les, the great Uncle of Sager, right? The entire Torah Shalapeh we have passes through him. Incredible. Hager Tzedek, a nephew of Uncle Titus. Anyway, so back in text 9. El boy bin Emide, before I leave, great rabbi, ask anything to Eten Loch and I'll give it to you. The great Vespasian, before he went back to Rome to take up his Caesarship, he told the great of Yochanan, ask me anything and I'll give it to you. Amalei, he said, ten li yavna v'chachameho. Give me yavna and the sages. V'shashilta the Rabbi Gamliel and protect the family of Rabbi Gamliel. You shouldn't kill out the family of Rabbi Gamliel. He was the Nasi. V'asvata the Ratzadok and make sure you get a doctor for Ratzadok who was critically ill. He fasted many years for the temple not to be destroyed. So he asked for that. So, Korele Rabbi Yosef, Mekimia. Rabbi Yosef said, say what? And Rabbi Akiva, why didn't he ask for the temple? The great Asp Aspasiano said, oh great rabbi, ask me anything. So there's a posik in Isaiah 44. He should have asked for the temple. There's a posik in Isaiah 44. Meshev chachamim ochor v'datam yisakel. When God wants to punish the Jewish people, he makes the great Chachamim go backwards and Vedatam Yisakel, he gives them what? Stop the cup. Stop the cup. Stop the cup. How do you say that in English? He makes the great rabbis foolish. Like in Europe before the Holocaust. People ask the great rabbis, should I what? Go to Israel. Go to Israel. Go to America. Don't leave. Everything is going to be fine here. I had a neighbor in Sheepshead Bay who remembers in 1936, he died, he was 99, this neighbor of mine. He remembers in 1936, Zev Jabotinsky came to his town in Poland. And he said, Yidin and fire brand Jews, 1936. The war didn't break out until 39. He said, Jews, pack up, run away, there's a fire, a fire, get out of here. And all the great rabbis said, I'm a shigineb, a rebel rouser, nobody leave, the great rabbi said. He's a meshugineb. This is the posuk, meshif chachomim achor v'datam yisakel. When God wants to punish the Jewish people, he makes the greatest chachomim foolish to give wrong, deadly advice. And that's what the Talmud says about here, about the great of Yochanan ben Zakkai. He should have asked for what? For, uh, the for the temple. So what was he thinking, Akimia? He was thinking to fast the Maruba loy to fast. What does that mean, Ruvain? If you, if, you, if you ask for too much, you might get nothing. Right? If he asked for the temple, the guy said, what are you, nuts? You get nothing. So he, he figured, Kulahai loyovit, and even a small favor he will not be granted. And therefore, in his mind, he asked for what? 
Yavna instead of the Beis Hamikdash. Again, if the temple was spared, buddy, Jewish history would take a completely different turn. No Holocaust, no pogroms, no ter- no bombings in Sparrow and Cafe moment. Okay, living with decisions. Look at footnote ten, please. If you don't have a paper, please look in with somebody. Footnote ten. This is Avos the Rabnosim. Amaloi Atu Rabbi Yochem and Zaka, you are the great rabbi. Show Matal. Ask whatever you want. I'll give you. Amaloi Eini Mevakes Shela Yavna. I only ask for Yavna. Footnote ten. Sheelech I'll go. Ve'eshtem et and I'll teach my Talmidim, and I'll do the mitzvot. Amaloi Lech. So the great Espionus said, Go. B'chol Hashemat Arot Shalasos. Whatever you want to do, do. Again, he uh, blew it. He blew it. The great of Yochum and Zakkai, the leader of world Jewry. Now, many years later on his deathbed, he lived to be 120, surely. Many years later, he was haunted by this tragic dilemma. Look at footnote 11 from Talmud Bavli Brochot. Keshechol of Yochum and Zakkai. Yochum and Zakkai was sick, he was dying. Nechtuzu Tamid of Lavakroi. His Talmidim came in to say goodbye. Footnote 11. When he saw them, the great rabbi began to cry, to weep. Omeloi Talmidov, Rebbe, why are you crying? Ner Yisrael, Amud Hayamani, Patish Chazak, the light of Israel, the, the mighty hammer, the pillar of Judaism, why are you crying? Don't you know you're going where? To be hugged by the one above? Why are you crying? Omelahem, look what he said. Yes, if they would take me in front of a human king, today he's here, the next day he's in the grave. Shim Koresalai, the human king becomes angry. Right? And he puts me in jail. And if he puts me to death, because physical death, what, you know, you get, move up to a higher level. And if, if, if a human king, I could pay off, maybe bribe, and yet, for all that, if I would face judgment of human king, I would cry, and now, where am I being taken, Rabbi Yaakov, where? I'm going to face the king of all kings. Right? Not like a human king. God lives forever, forever and ever. His anger is everlasting. And if he puts me in jail, it's forever. And to be an uh, oilam abad, to be shut out, that's mitat olam. And I can't bribe God with words or with money. Oh, listen to this. And not only that, the great rabbi said, you know I'm crying. There's two paths in front of me. You see that? The great rabbi, the Nasi of Am Yisrael, the Av Bezdin, was afraid that he, after all of his mitzvot and maizim toivim, maybe Chava, where is he going? Gehenna. Gehenna. What about a low life like me? If he was afraid, he said, there are two paths in front of me. Acha shal ganeidim, acha shal gehenim, v'eini yodeya. And he doesn't know the eizim alichim oti. And he doesn't know what? Where they're going to take me. V'loy efka, shouldn't cry. If he's afraid, what should I say? What should I say? We think that we're righteous. Who knows the way God keeps score? Sure, though she, we don't know how he keeps score. But I'll give you a hint. The Rabbeinu Tam says, how do you know how God keeps score? How do you know how he keeps score? Remember Mayor Koch, he passed away a few years ago. Mayor yeah. Koch yeah. used to go around, how am I doing, how am I doing, right? <laughs> Rabbeinu Tom says, how do you know how you're doing in God's book? Yeah. Says Rabbeinu Tom, there's a way, Bekimia. If you are zaycheh to do a mitzvah, which is ignored 
and neglected by the vast majority of the Jewish people. And you have the schus to perform that mitzvah, which even from Yidin are neglect or ignore for whatever reason. And you do that mitzvah, says Rabbeinu Tam, that's a siman that in God's book you rate A-OK. That's what Rabbeinu Tam says. You listen to me? He didn't say what means. He says any mitzvah. So, what mitzvah, Sharon? The mitzvah of Aliyah. Many from Jews ignore that mitzvah, right? 70% of American Jewry was never even here. So we have the schus to do a mitzvah that is ignored by the majority of the Jewish people, and we have that schus, that's a siman ruvain, according to Rabbeinu Tam, you can take it to the bank, that we are A-OK in God's book. But the great rabbi, he lived in Israel, he was still afraid. He doesn't know where they're taking me, I shouldn't cry. Why was he so afraid, buddy? We'll see why. He was haunted by his decision of 40 years ago. Oh. Rabbeinu. They said, Rebbe Bechenu, before you die, bless us. Amalehem, what did he say to them? Yirotzain. Shetehei more shemayim aleichem kemore bosredam. My best blessing to you, Talmidim, is that you should fear God like you feel what? Like you fear a human being. You hear this? You should fear God like you feel, fear a boss of Adam. That's all. I should only fear God as much as I fear what? A human being? The rabbi knows human nature. Halavai, you should fear God as much as you fear what? A man. Teidu, no. Right? When a person does an Aveda, he wants to go into a massage parlor. Or he wants to go into where? Break into someone's house. What is he? He looks around that no person should see him. Mm, now it's safe to go into the massage parlor or break into someone's home. Who is he afraid of? Who does he look around? He's afraid of God. Ah, he's afraid of the person. Yeah. Oh, there's a story to Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, you know, he had a balagula. You know what a balagula means? A wagon driver. A wagon driver, right? So they're driving, he hired him. Like a Sherut, he hired him. He's driving with him. So the, the Balagula, the wagon driver, stops on the side of the road, and the horse is hungry. So the horse wants to eat, you know, and so he tells the Vashem Tov, take a watch that the owner is not looking, that nobody's looking. He tells Vashem Tov to be a lookout for him, that the, the horse is hungry. What do you do? He has no food with him. So he took him in private property to eat there, whatever, then whatever, oats, whatever. He said, Vashem Tov, warn me no one's looking. So he takes the horse, the horse of the screams, Somebody's looking, somebody's looking, somebody's looking. So the Valgula, you look around. I don't see anybody. Who's looking? Somebody's looking, somebody's looking. Somebody's looking. Ah, the, I don't know if the horse died, but the, somebody's looking. So one second, please let me just finish. And of course, we'll take questions later. Uh, so. Well, that's, that's human nature, right? Before you do a vera, somebody's looking. Halavai, you should fear God as what? As you fear the human being. Vishas Pitarosoi, as he's dying, Omalahem, what does he say to them? Pinu Kalim Neatuma, take out all the furniture from the house. Why? Because all the furniture in the house with a dead guy in it becomes what? Tumas mate. Tumas Oyel. So he said, this is what he had on his mind as he's dying, right? He's afraid he's going to the other place, down under, can you imagine? He says, uh, strange, take out all the furniture before I die, I don't want it to be contaminated. And prepare a chair for King Cheskiyohu. Who's King Cheskiyohu? King Cheskiyohu. Cheskiyohu HaMelech had died hundreds of years before. So what does he say? What does he say? What, buddy? Prepare a chair. Chaskir HaMelech is coming to visit me. The Zohar says when a person dies, it's very traumatic, frightening experience, to say the least. So God, in his divine compassion, sends a relative from the other side to escort him across. The Chesed HaBoreh. You read the books, the near-death experiences by thousands of people. They all say what the Zohar said 2,000 years ago, 
that when, as a person is dying, as a dead relative comes to, yeah. to, to escort him. This way your table's waiting. Cheskiyo <laughs> HaMelech, Shirley, well, let me finish then, we'll ask, was his great-grandfather. He came to escort him across. I'll tell you a story from my family. Eyewitness. My grandmother had a sister, and they were very close. My grandmother's name was Sura. In Yiddish, it's Sucha, right? Her name was Sura. And she had a, 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 a younger sister, Hannah. They were very close. My grandmother passed away. And seven years later, the younger sister, Hannah, was in a coma in Maimonides Hospital. Maimonides Hospital. In a coma for weeks. Seven years after my, bab my Baba died. Her children are around the bed, right? In a coma for weeks. All of a sudden, my cousins were there. They told me this, all of them. She opens her eyes wide, this Hannah who was in a coma for weeks, and she says, Sucha, Sucha, what's this to do? And she dies. Sucha is my Baba, in Yiddish, Sura, Sucha. She opened her eyes and she screamed, Sucha, what's this to do? What does that mean? Sarah, what are you doing here, Sarah? You died seven years ago. She came, for her. She came to get her. She came to get her. She came to get her. Cheskiyo HaMelech was his great-grandfather. He came to get him. Now, why him? He had other, many other relatives, Sharona. Why him? To calm him down. You made the right decision. Because Cheskiyo HaMelech hundreds of years before also had to choose. Remember, the city of Jerusalem was being besieged by the Assyrians. Right? right? And Cheskiyo HaMelech didn't know whether to attack, whether to surrender. Right? right. And Yeshishai HaNavi told him, don't surrender. Sur don't surrender. And the next night, the entire army was what? Right there. Dead. So he made the right decision. He didn't surrender. So perhaps he came to calm him down like he also made the right decision. Hmm? Huh? He chose correctly even though he felt he did not. So perhaps that's why this relative came. If you look at footnote 12, this is from Rav Soloveitchik. Footnote 12. Makshina olam. Lama velo od. On his deathbed he added... There are two paths in front of me, says the great rabbi as he's dying. When the great rabbi said, not only this, there are two paths in front of me to explain why he's weeping on his deathbed. For 40 years, he was haunted by this decision, Rabbi Yaakov and Yavna. Perhaps he made the wrong decision. Mayos Chorben Beit HaMikdash. From the time the temple was destroyed. Lifnei Shonim. Hoya Posek Beshele Chamura. He was put on the spot. He had to be done in a, such a difficult, critical Shela. Vlohoya Botoach in Tov Posak. And he didn't know whether he passed what correctly by asking for Yavna instead of what the temple. Kasha Aspasionus Kesa. You see the arrow? Kasha Aspasionus Kesa upon Abyokum and Zakai. When Vespasian turned to him and he said, Boy, my name Midi, ask me anything and I'll grant it to you. Abyokum and Zakai should have said, Give me time, Ruben, to think about it. Let me consult my colleagues. But no, on the spot he said, Miyad, ten li yavna v'chachameho. On the spot he said, what? Give me yavna and the chachamim. Yiddis, with the arrow ha-gemara, kor Reb Yosef, Reb Tem, Reb Kiva, and they applied the pasuk in what? In Shayo 44, Meshif chachamim achar, when God wants to punish the Jewish people, he makes the wisest sages foolish, the datum Yisakel, he gives them a stop the cup. He should have said, he should have said, 
Lishraf Kino Zimni, give me time, Rabbi Yaakov, give me time to consult what? The Sanhedrin. Why did he have to answer right away? He would be able to what? Save, Save Jerusalem and the temple. He thought to fast to fast. He was afraid that what? That he would get nothing. And even a small favor he would not be granted. Bemila Macherot says the great Vasalavechik, Bemila Macherot, Bakosha Gedola Kazot, this great request, Katsolat Yushalayim, he figured by asking for Yushalayim, as Pasyonus Docha, he would, uh, he would what? Get nothing. Kasha Om, a Yehudi, Hoya Mafsi Deshneim, the Jewish people will wind up with nothing. They would lose this and that, Gamet Yushalayim, the Gamet Chachne Yavna. He would lose both. At Achroazot, this haunting, difficult, critical decision, he put him on the spot. Tell me right away what you want. What is intuitive? Intuitive. 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 Who could know from before Eich Aspasionis Yagiv? How Aspasionis Vespasian would react? Al Ota Bakasha Shall I tell you Shalayim? You Chutzpaniki, you Shalayim is a crown jewel, right? Hashayla Hazot Shayla Chamura. This Shayla Ulai Hashayla Chamura Biyote Betoldos Yisrael. It is the most difficult grappling question that the Jewish people ever had to decide was this Shela. And he should have asked for time. Let me consult. On the spot he said, what, Yavna, the most, Shela Chamura, Biyote told us Yisrael, the Lifzoik Oto Hoya Tzorek Rabbi Yochum Zaka Be'atzmo. Without asking, we should have asked, let me consult my colleagues. Toch Kedei Dibur on the spot. You hear? And this haunted him, buddy. Till his dying day, he was afraid that he made the wrong decision. Perhaps he's going down under. Now, the question is, remember, you look, you look in jo Josephus, who was an eyewitness, buddy, there was the Baryonim. There were the Zealots who said, let's fight. Great rabbi. What are you, a chicken? Don't you remember 200 years earlier? The Maccabees. You're saying we're outnumbered, we're outgunned? What about the Maccabees, only 200, not the, not the football team. Maccabees, 200 years earlier, this is 200 years after the Hanukkah miracle. It was also God gave giborim biyat halashim, v'rabim biyat miyatim. So Rabbi, we are the new Maccabees. Why are you against us? What are you, a peacenik? Great Rabbi, you're a peacenik. What are you, a merits? Where's your Maccabee spirit? That's what they said to him. So Taka, buddy, what's the difference? Why Taka, this was not like the Maccabees 200 years earlier. Giborim miyat chaloshim, rabim miyat miyatim. So the Rav Sabechik answers as follows. The Maccabees were fighting the Greeks. The Greeks were persecuting and trying to stamp out the Jewish religion. Therefore, the miracle took place with Shemin. Now, remember, the entire temple service was canceled. There, wasn't, there was no menorah, but there was no ketores either. What's a holier service, Sharona? Ketores or the menorah? Ketores is much holier. So the question is, if God wants to make a miracle, he could have made ketores appear. There was no ketores either, which is a much holier service than what? Than a menorah. Why did God choose to manifest the, the miracle dafke with Shemen? Because Shemen is a symbol. Beautiful. Because Shemen is a symbol. Shemen is Rosh Tevot, FBI. Shabbat Mila Nida. The Greeks outlawed the Jewish religion. But which three mitzvahs do they make it capital punishment to keep? Shabbat, 
Mila Nida. If you kept the other mitzvahs, they just lash you, put you in jail. But if you kept Shabbat, Rabbi Yaakov, or Mila or Nida, they would execute you. The Greeks were very smart. They knew the entire Jewish religion stands on what, Rabbi Yaakov? Shabbat. Shabbat is Kedushat Zman, Mila and Nida, it's Kedushat Zaguf, that's Judaism in a nutshell. If they could outlaw Shemen, Shabbat, Mila and Nida, Judaism is what? Cancelled, kaput. Shabbat is Kedushat Zman, Mila and Nida is Kedushat Zaguf. We can sanctify time, Shabbat is a symbol of that, and we can sanctify our bodies through what? Taras HaMishpoch and Brit Mila, that's Judaism. If they can outlaw Shemen, the Jewish religion is canceled. So, Rav Salvechik explained, therefore the Maccabees had no choice. Without the Jewish religion, the Jewish people can't survive. We had no choice, we had to fight, it was a fight for Yahadut. It was a holy religious war. No religious freedom. But Rav Salvechik explains at this stage, the Romans allowed us to practice our religion. They just wanted political control of the temple, of Jerusalem. At this stage of the game, says Rav Soloveitchik, they did not wage a religious war against us like the Greeks did. Therefore, we had an option. You're outnumbered, you're outgunned. It's not a war to save Judaism. There ain't some chenalanes. Could have committed suicide? The Maccabees had no choice, Ruvain. Without Judaism, we're lost anyway. But here was not a struggle for Judaism. The Romans allowed us to practice our religion. They just want the political control. And so then, ain't some chenalanes. If it's not a war for Judaism, then you have to operate with what? Derech Ateva. Derech Ateva, you can't fight the mighty Roman army. 52 years later, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Hadrian. That was a war against the Jewish religion. Therefore, 52 years later, Bar Kokhba, with the blessing of Rabbi Kiva, did fight against all odds. Because that was a war, Rabbi Yaakov, for the Jewish religion. Hadrian declared war on the Jewish religion. Unlike Vaspasianus and Titus, who did not declare war on the Jewish religion, War for political uh, uh, control, you don't rely on miracles. But 52 years later, Hadrian cracked down on the Jewish religion. And whose advice? Rav Tavetik quotes Yishalmi. Acher. Can you imagine? The worst enemies of the Jewish people, buddy, come from us. The apostle in Yishayo. Your destroyers will come from your own loins. The great Elisha ben Avua became such a kofer a self-hating Jew, that he advised Hadrian, you'll never be able to conquer the Jewish people politically unless you stamp out the Jewish religion. This is how he advised Hadrian 52 years after the Korban. So therefore, Bar Kokhba, Rabbi Kiva, had no option but what? Rabbi Yaakov. They had to fight, even though it was suicidal. Because without the Jewish religion, we're lost anyway. The worst enemies of the Jewish people come from us. Last night in Tel Aviv, there was a demonstration of, of, of merits and peace now, marching with the Palestinians against our soldiers. Can you imagine that in Tel Aviv? And while, God has a sense of humor. While they were marching, there was a... So the peaceniks had a scatter. God has a sense of humor. The peaceniks were marching with the Palestinian brothers, and then there were rockets. Ooh. So the peaceniks had to run into the shelters. Broke up the demonstration. Kawinky <laughs> dinky. I don't think so. Anyway, anyway. So therefore, therefore, Yochan Zakai didn't fight. It was not a war against the Jewish religion at this stage. That only happened later when Hadrian, under Bar Kokhba, and there, on the device of Acher, said Rav Salvechi, quoting Arishalmi, and therefore, uh, Bar Kokhba had no choice but to what? Fight. To fight. Right? Now, 
Look at footnote 13. It's incredible. It's Ralph Cook. Footnote 13. Isn't it strange that he said, take out the vessels from the house? The guy is dying. So he says, take out the sofa. I don't want it to become too because it's, how do you put it in the mikveh, right? A guy dies. Everything in the house becomes what? Tome. Tome. How are you going to toivel a sofa? So he's worried about the sofa. Get the sofa out. It's strange. Nobody. Why did he say take out the furniture? Look at footnote 13. See that? This is Rav Cook. Rav Yochem and Zaka Yoda. Shachosh the boy al shenimna melavakesh et kiyuma shal malchus Yisrael asmaromim. He should have said, uh, let us have our own government. Let us have our own government. Ask anything. So he should have said, let us have our own sovereignty, right? He didn't ask that. Utamuta bikesh rak et yavna. Instead, he only asked for what? Didn't ask for political control. He only asked for yavna. Right? V'chachomeo, and the rabbis there. Umikan she kaviyochel mezalzel hu b'chashivoto shela masgeret hamalachtis. So people accuse them of uh, cheapening the importance of what? Of sovereignty in the land of Israel. Why didn't you ask for that? V'lechein hoita harasa kfula. Therefore, on his deathbed, as he's dying, he gave a double, Rabbi Yaakov, double instructions. Penu kelim, take out the furniture. What was the act of doing anything? Kedei laharot shehu chas al pachim ketanim ha nechnosim afei mahalech hagula. I don't understand what that means. What is that pachim ketanim? Small uh, vessels. Somehow that's part of the gula process. I don't know what he means by that. You have, Yaakov got the pachim ketanim. Vechinu kisel cheskiyo. Why did he say prepare a chair for cheskiyo ha-melech? Why did another dead relative come to get him? Cheskiyo ha-melech, the Talmud and Hedman says that God wanted to what? Make him Moshiach. You hear? Cheskiyo ha-melech, God wanted to make him Moshiach. So he came to escort him that, the, that you chose correctly, the time is not right. You chose correctly by not asking for the Holy Temple because it's not time for Mashiach yet. Not time yet. You hear? So God wanted to make Cheskyo HaMelech Mashiach. Sanhedrin, page 102. But God did not make him Mashiach. Imagine, buddy, Mashiach could have come he lived 2,600 years ago. Again, no Holocaust. Mashiach would have come 2,600 years ago. No Holocaust. Bikesh HaKudosh Baruch Hu Lasod Cheskiyo HaMelech Mashiach. But God didn't. Why? He didn't sing a song. Right? He didn't say Hallel. But Rav Kook gives another read. That's what the Gemara says. He didn't say Hallel. He didn't acknowledge a great miracle that in one night 185,000 Hamasniks dropped dead by the gates of Jerusalem. Look at the book of Kings 2. In one night, 185,000 uh, Assyrians dropped dead in one night. He didn't say Hallel. So God took away from him the job of Mashiach. But if Cook gives another reason, I don't know where he gets his reason from. Take a look. Somehow, Cheskiyo HaMelech was not concerned with working and developing the land of Israel. I don't know where he gets this from, Rubain, but the Gemara says, because he didn't say Shira. Rav Kook, Rav Kook is saying in footnote 13 that another reason why God didn't make a Mashiach, because Mashiach has to encourage the people to develop the land of Israel, not to uproot Jews from and kick them out, but to develop every nook and cranny of the land of Israel. Cheskyu HaMelech didn't make that a priority, and therefore, what? God did not make him the Mashiach. Where did he write this? Did he write this at the Hesped of Herzl? He wrote this in Pasha's Mitzorah. If you look at Rav Cook's work on Pasha's Mitzorah, this is where he writes this. And I quote from there, footnote 13. But look how important it is that what? To, to what? To work the land of Israel. To work the land of Israel. To develop every nook and cranny. 
and he didn't do that, therefore what? He lost the job. Now where's Rav Cook coming from, Sonia? I'll tell you where he's coming from. You want to know? I'll tell you. Yeah. We're right before Shemitah, aren't we? Right. We can talk. We can talk, right? Rav Cook is coming from Pasha's Bahar. In Pasha's Bahar that speaks about what? Shemitah. It says, Ki tovo ela oret. Will you come to the land that I give you? V'shof to oret Shabbat Lashem. The, the land shall rest a Shabbat to Hashem. Then it says, Sheishonim Tizra Sadecho. Six years you shall plow the field, and six years you shall prune your vineyards. And in the seventh year, it's what? Shemitah. So if some cipher asked the question, Ruvain, it's not in chronological. First, the Torah should have said, six years you plow your field. And six years you'll prune your vineyards. And then the seventh year will be what? Shemitah. It doesn't say that. It says, speak to the Jewish people. First it says the, the land has to rest on the seventh year. And then it says six years you shall work. It should be what? Chava, the other way around. Lebech. First it should say six years work the land, and the seventh year Shemitah. No, it says no. Come into the land, right away observe Shemitah, and then work six years. Why? Says the Chsam Sofer. He was Haredi. <laughs> he was Haredi. The Torah is telling me that just like there's a mitzvah to what? To what? Rest. To rest, rest on Shemitah. Part of the mitzvah of resting on Shemitah is to work the land six years. Working on a kibbutz, working the land is part of the mitzvah of Shemitah. Who knows this? Just like there's a mitzvah to rest, Shaftar al Shabbos Lashem, Sheishon Tizah Sadecho, an extension of the mitzvah of Shemitah, said Rasam Sofer. It's a two-part mitzvah, Sonia. There's a mitzvah to rest on Shemitah, but there's a mitzvah to work the land up until Shemitah. Therefore, first the Torah says Shemitah, that's a mitzvah, and extending from that, an out, what's the word, outgrowth, a spin-off of that is Shei Shonim Tizra Sadecha, the Shei Shonim Tizma Karmecha. So Rav Kook is based on this Chavsam Sofer. There's a mitzvah to develop and work the land of Israel. That's part of the mitzvah of what? A Shemitah. And for some reason, the great Cheskyo Amelech, for some reason, neglected that mitzvah. And therefore God says, you're fired. Can you imagine that? Mashiach could have been here 2,600 years ago. Shemitah, the symbol of Kol Kula, and included in that mitzvah, you hear this, is to work the land of Israel. Some cipher has another raya, buddy. In the book of Ruth, it says that Boaz, the shofet, you know what a shofet was? Sure. Chief rabbi plus plus. Chief rabbi, busy man. Like, huh? It says he went himself to winnow the grain. So first, some cipher asks, we know Tanakh is not a history book. Why do we need to know that Boaz, the chief rabbi, went to winnow grain? Who cares? Right? Another question he asked. He was a very rich man. Remember the Ponderosa? He, was a very, he had a lot of workers. Why did the chief rabbi himself have to go winnow the grain? And the, why does the Navi have to tell me that? Couldn't he send one of his shamosim? He had many workers. Remember he said, Shalom. He greeted them, many workers. So why does the Navi go out of its way to write, who wrote the book of Ruth? Who wrote the book Shmuel. of Ruth? Shmuel Navi. Tell me no, that Boaz, the great Shofet, personally went to winnow his grain. The English word granary says goron. English word granary comes from the goron. Says the Chav to teach that working the land of Israel is a mitzvah. And what kind of mitzvah? The chief rabbi of Israel has to leave Hechel Shlomo 
office full, full of people waiting. Sorry, a couple of hours a day, I have to personally what? Winnow my grain. The great Sam Soifer, Haredi rabbi, the mitzvah of what? Of working the land of Israel is such a mitzvah that it's part and parcel of what? Rabbi Yaakov, of the mitzvah of Shemitah. Therefore, it says Shemitah and then work the land. It's incredible. It should be the other way around. At Kedekach is the mitzvah of what? Of work, working and developing the Holy Land of Israel that the Navi goes out of its way to write that Boaz, it's not a history book, 3,000 years ago Boaz went to win all the grain. It's a message for us, no matter how great you are and how many workers you have, there's a mitzvah to what? To personally work the land of Israel. And that's part of the mitzvah doshi of what? Schmidt, the pay to come today. That's a big chidush, according to some cipher. Now, last time I checked the 613, where's the mitzvah to work the land? It's part of Shmita. That's the Ksam Seifer's great chidush. In the mitzvah of Shemitah, just like there's a mitzvah what? To uh, rest on the seventh year, there's a mitzvah to work the land during the six years. That's one great mitzvah. Wow. Pretty interesting. And for some reason, Rabbi Yochan, not the, what's it? Cheskyo HaMelech, for some reason, did not what? Work the land or have the people do that. And as a result, he, uh, he what? He forfeited the right to be the, uh, the Mashiach. Wow, what a powerful lesson for us. But looks like he chose correctly, buddy. We haven't had a base of Migdash for 1944 years. And we're still here. Could the Jewish people survive one day without Torah Yeshiva? No. no. So without the Migdash, Michael, we're still here. Without the Chachamim, we can't survive even one day. So in hindsight, buddy, it looks like the great rabbi chose correctly. The proof is not in the pudding. The proof is in the 2,000 years later almost. We're still here even without a Migdash. But without the Chachamim, Sonia, without the rabbis, the Jewish people would have long time ago what? Gone. Gone assimilated. So the great rabbi, in hindsight, uh, made the right decision. He felt if you're asking for the Migdash, you'll get nothing. Right? So he, he figured, so fast to Maruba, like to fast. If you grab too much, you might not get um, nothing at all. Might not get nothing at all. Right? So it's a great idea to adopt a chayal. I have my chayal that I'm, uh, that I'm adopting for. His name is Nachman Natan Ben Rivka. His father actually came to the yeshiva. His father came to the yeshiva. And asked. And asked, please daven for my son. My son is in Gaza. I don't know. He, he's not, he lives in Jerusalem somewhere. The father gave me the petek, please dab him for my son, he's in Gaza, Nachman Natan ben, uh, ben Rivka. These holy, holy chayalim, these angels. David ben Shulamit. Everyone says a certain number you can call or go to the internet. And uh, remember we said, it says, Elaf Lamate, Elaf Lamate. It's based on a Pasuk Nesifri. When Moshe sent the chayalim to fight Midian, it says, Elaf Lamate, Elaf Lamate. And then it says he sent 12,000. I know how to count. But El of Lamata, El of Lamata is not 12,000, it's 24,000. So how come the, the, the Pasuk says 12,000? Beautiful. Says the Sifri, for every Chayal in Gaza, throne is incredible. Sifri, every Chayal, there was a, a designated hitter, a designated Tilim sayer for that Chayal. So you have El of Lamata, for every thousand of the tribe fighting, there was another thousand whose job was specifically to daven for that particular chayal. A sifri, 2,000 years ago, surely. So, they have to daven for all of them. yes, of course, but it's Elif Lamate, Elif Lamate, to have a specific chayal that we are, I am davening for him, everyone should adopt the chayal. Tehillim keneget tilim. Get it? Tehillim neget tilim. Okay. Yes? Yes? Mayor, Mayor Ben Elisheva. Mayor Ben Elisheva. Liz's son. Me, Go ahead. Me from Gaza. 
Gaza. And he spoke to me besides his mother, and he said, thank all of you, us for davening for him. So please put it on your... Mayor Ben Elisheva. Mayor Ben Elisheva. Liz's Liz. Liz. son, yeah. A tzaddik. He's in the tunnels. He's in the tunnels. No, yes, no, Rivka. Yeah. He came out and said, well, I guess, uh, we don't need an army. He gave me two names. Did you see that? We, yeah. we just have to, we just have to, have to, have to and there will be no team. I can't believe that. So why did Moses send Elif Lamate? He knows more than Moses. So he said, you don't need no soldiers? Saka Moses had an army. I, I'm asked. <laughs> I don't know. Moshe sent Elif Lamate. Why didn't he rely on God? God only helps those who help themselves. The Chalonu Anoshim, Moshe. Yeshua Benun was the chief of the idea. A yeshiva Bacher. Yeshua Benun was the Rosh Koilo. So he took him out of the Yeshiva Sharona and he, he made him chief of the IDF. Right? He was no youngster, 55 years old. <laughs> right? At that time. So, who's a bigger tzaddik than Moses and Yeshua? And they fought. Yeshua fought for seven years to conquer Israel. Why do you just rely on God? Ain't some He didn't ask that rabbi. He, ask that rabbi. he knows better than Yeshua Benun. He knows better than Moses and Yeshua Benun, right? Some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up. What? Yeah. That, uh, they were cutting wheat. The Israelis was cutting wheat in a field in the south. Yeah. And when they were cutting the wheat down for Shmira for Pesach, you know. Yeah. So what happened was uh, there was a tunnel. So the tunnel was underneath the wheat fields. Yeah. And when the terrorists came up, they thought they'd have cover. There was no cover, and they mowed them right down. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Nisim, yes. I didn't tell you the end. We have to make you start loot, Rivka. Otherwise, he won't do his. Go ahead. Rabbi, yeah. In, in other words, you don't need any money from the government. <laughs> you get mon. Oh, you get mon. <laughs> right, mon, right. <laughs> what? Yes. I have two. Natan ben Simcha. Okay, Natan. Natan ben Simcha, he's in Gaza. Shem should protect him. But each one should adopt a pen pal, not a pen pal, a tilim pal. Elef lamate, elef lamate. Yes, so you have a tilim? Can you give me a tilim? Vakasha? Say a peri before I leave. Rabbi, which one you say? Rabbi. She has one more back there. Kuflamid, yes. Kuflamid, yes. Yes. Sfi Moshe ben Ben Eliza. Kuf Lamit. Yeah. Kuf Lamit. Shira Malot. Bimakin Gosih. Adenoi. Adenoi. Shima Bekoili. Tienos Nero Kashuvos. La Koltach Nunai. Imavono Tishmaya. Adenoi Miyamod. Kim Khoasli Khalamanti Vore. Kiviti Adenoi Kifta Nafshi Vidvaroi Ocholti Nafshi Ladenoi Mishomim La Boker Shomrim La Boker Yache Yisrael Adenoi Kilnoi Chesed Barbi Mofedus Vu Yivde Es Yisrael Mikol Avonotav Kuf Lamid 130 Vu Yivde Es Yisrael Mikol Avonotav Thank you Shkach Baratia Shalom, thank you very much.